Genesis 1. So if you want to go to Genesis 1, 26, uh, we want to look uh, back, as uh, why we call it, we're calling this serious foundation, because we've gone back to the very beginning. And what we've seen that, that the gospel is not something that begins in Matthew chapter 1. Indeed, the gospel is all the way back in creation. You cannot separate the gospel of Jesus Christ from the pages of Scripture. It's replete with it. It's everywhere. In Luke 24, when Jesus meets his disciples on the road to Emmaus, this is indeed what he does. He takes them back through the entire Old Testament to see that it's all about Jesus. So from Genesis 1, 26 this morning and the following, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens. And over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold. I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so, and God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning and sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in that day, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant from the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground. The mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll conclude there for the time being. But as we uh, approach foundations of biblical womanhood, we've looked at a number of topics in this series, and uh, we, we want to conclude here this morning for a number of different reasons. We have said oftentimes that uh, as we read through Genesis 1 and 2, there's a building effect that goes on. That God begins uh, with sort of the simpler creations and then builds his way up. Uh, we see in the way that Genesis 1 and 2 is written that God saves his greatest creative acts for the end. In his creation of man, we see that man is set apart from the rest of creation. Mankind is unique. God didn't take dogs or dolphins and breathe 
his very breath into their nostrils. There's something special, there's something unique to the design of them, to their creation. In other words, the very structure of these chapters points us to how highly God cares for and loves this part of his creation. Humanity, human beings are precious in God's sight. They are deserving of greater uh, respect. They are given greater authority. All these things we see in God's creative acts. And so, in that vein, in that line of thinking, I would contend, actually, God's last creative act is what? Is woman. She holds a special place in the creative realm and ought to hold a special place in our thinking in today's society. Created as a helper uh, to the man, we said last week, that this design was built into nature. It goes beyond just roles that we play, although those are important, and I think uh, we see that there are certain roles that men are to play in life, and women as well. But the basis for these roles is not the roles themselves, it's, it's creation itself, it's seen in nature and found in nature. And so the first thing we see is, uh, about biblical womanhood is that married women should hold their husbands in the highest esteem. Now as we dig into this and look for practical uh, application for today's world and today's living, some helpful principles I think uh, are called for here. First of all, that you'll uh, see throughout the pages of Scripture that it's uh, not just women that are called to submit, uh, men are called to submit as well. Husbands are called to submit to God. We have uh, the greater responsibility in so many different ways. We answer to God. God is the one that calls us to be leaders in our marriages, to be leaders in our own. <coughs> Wives are called to submit to their husbands. Another helpful principle here, and I think it helps explain better what this sometimes difficult uh, word like submission is and means. It means that, that the wife is the one who is called to believe first in her husband and to encourage him in every endeavor. Maybe it goes without say that, that to be a godly husband, at least, is a difficult call, for sure. It requires a lot of uh, uh, encouragement, a lot of second-guessing that goes on. Your wife is brought side by side with her husband to encourage him in this pursuit. There's a bumper sticker I've often seen that says, One day I hope to become the person my dog thinks I am. <laughs> Even more so, I, uh, the older I get, the longer I'm married. I would alter that greatly and say, I want to become the person my wife thinks I am. I've been blessed. Uh, she thinks very highly uh, of me. Uh, sometimes too hot, I'll admit. But it encourages me on, and this is exactly what wives are called to do. It's also a principle here that if husbands are called 
to lead their wives and families with their best intentions, the, the wife and family's best intentions at heart, then this is to help with the submission aspect of the biblical principle here. Another valuable and helpful, I think, practical principle in building the case for biblical womanhood is to look back at the wedding vows themselves that most of us, some of us have taken. And to see that these vows, these promises that we made to one another aren't simply you know, scripted by ourselves, although that has become a trend today to write your own wedding vows. But in Christian marriage, they're based on something much greater than that. They're based upon promises that God has made to you and to me. That, 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 that literally God has, has bound himself to us. Bonds of love and faithfulness. Therefore, when we give ourselves in matrimony to another. It's the same thing that we are doing there. Somebody once asked me if I ever talked about or thought about divorce in my marriage. I told them, no, absolutely not. We talk about murder sometimes. <laughs> Probably more often than we should. Um, but we don't talk about divorce. That's just not an option. And, and you know, you may say, well, that's, that's, that's being naive. Well, no, it's not. So I can point you back to the foundations of my marriage, just like I hope that you can point me back to the foundations of yours as well. Built upon unshakable promises, that God has made to you thousands of years ago that have stood the test of time. And you see proof of that, don't you? In the cross, that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of each one of these promises that God has made to you. And therefore, when we look at marriage, you see the gospel played out, lived, out. This has to be the foundation of every Christian marriage. The beautiful reminder of that, I'm sure you've heard the story of Robertson McQuilkin before, but it's one of those uh, accounts that probably we need to read at least once a year. Robertson McQuilkin was the president of Columbia Bible College down in Columbia. Uh, South Carolina. He served for many years as president of this uh, organization. And his wife Muriel, in, 90, in really the, the later 80s, developed dementia. And if you've ever experienced dementia, you know it's a horrible, horrible condition that gets progressively worse, ending in death, unfortunately. But as Muriel continued to worsen, it became more and more apparent that McQuilkin was going to have to resign his position as president of this Bible college. And so in April of 1990, he addressed the student body. That's what he said at the end of his resignation speech. He said, recently it's become apparent that Muriel is contented most of the time she is with me, and almost none of the time I am away from her. It is not just discontent, she is filled with fear, even terror, that she has lost me and always goes and search me when I leave home. So it is clear to me that she needs me now full time. The decision was made in a way 42 years ago when I promised to care for Muriel in sickness and in health till death do us part. So as I told the students and faculty, as a man of my word, 
Integrity has something to do with it, but so does fairness. She has cared for me fully and sacrificially all these years. If I cared for her for the next 40 years, I would not be out of her debt. Duty, however, can be grim and stoic, but there is more. He goes on to say, I love Muriel. She's a delight to me. Her childlike dependence and confidence in me, her warm love, occasional flashes of that wit I used to so relish, uh, her happy spirit and tough resilience in the face of her continually distressing frustration. Then he says this. He says, I don't have to care for her. I get to. It's a high honor to care for such a woman. You see how Christian marriage is so different than anything the world has to offer. The commitment of husbands to wives and wives to husbands. You want to turn the world on its head? Husbands, love your wives. Wives, hold your husbands in the highest esteem. Now the question always comes up, what if he's not an admirable man of God? Well, I would, again, first of all, point you back to the basis of the promises that you've made to one another. They're not based upon you, they're not based upon your performance, they're not based on your feelings. Certainly get that into your head. They're based upon God himself. And so that's why the Apostle Paul can, can say to, uh, to, to the rest, I say, uh, I, not the Lord. But if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. You see, the bonds of God's love, his promises to us are so strong, are so powerful, are so able to save that even if, one half of the relationship falters and fails. That God's bonds still hold the other. They are still edifying. They are still able to display the gospel. And so we see the gospel displayed clearly in this form of devotion to a believing spouse holding on, oftentimes for dear life, it would feel, to an unbelieving, imperfect, inadmirable spouse. And in even this great pain, and there is tremendous pain, I've seen it in a number of different times and ways. But it's here, and this is you this morning. A very powerful testimony of the gospel. Paul elsewhere says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Yes, some in their marriages, in your marriages, will be called to live this as well. But wives, this is a high and holy calling. But it's something that is based upon God's love for you, and therefore he equips. He will provide, and he will give to you what you need when you need it the most. Second calling, think of a woman, a godly, biblical woman, 
but she is called to stand guard over her children's hearts. And for single women, I think this is also a similar call to stand guard over the hearts of children in your midst, in your churches. You know, have you ever noticed, uh, I, I still watch from time to time um, uh, these nature programs. You ever notice that it, it's, it's usually the lioness that's the more ferocious of, of the two? Um, oftentimes it seems to be that way. Even in nature, we see women oftentimes as the defenders of the family. Well, this is a call to be a defender of your child's heart. Now, I grew up in a, a home where, you know, masculinity was a bizarre thing. It meant a lot of things that you didn't do. And uh, as I've tried to uh, take up sort of the discipline of journaling in my Bible and with my Bible, uh, I still fight against this childhood <coughs> uprearing where, like, writing in a diary was unmasculine. And so it, it's a weird thing for me, but um, I, I do it in fits and spurts. Uh, back in June, I, I wrote this down. Um, bear with me on this because I, I uh, there is some method I think to my madness. It, this is a, a selection of, of something that I journaled back in the early days of June of this year. Uh, imagine a day in the life of a pastor. You wake up one morning in June. It's a Friday. Supposedly your day off, and after your morning routine, you scroll through your personal Instagram feed as you wait at the door for your last child to find his shoes. You're struck by how many of your former students at, well, blur out the name of the Christian school where it once worked, are posting pictures of themselves holding rainbow flags as they attend pride celebrations. Several more have simply changed their background pictures to the pride rainbow regalia. You also notice that some of your other social media friends, in quotations, have chosen to post their preferred pronouns on their pages. You finally get everybody in the car as you go to Sam's Club for the purchase of hundreds of pounds of cereal to keep your family fed for the next week. You turn on the radio and hear about how Meyer is celebrating pride and giving a portion of its June proceeds to LGBTQAI plus charities. One child asks, doesn't the Bible call pride a sin? As you try to answer that question on the final leg of your journey, you pull past a group of people on the side of the highway holding up signs like defund the police and Black Lives Matter. You finally get the car parked and everyone unloaded from the minivan and loaded into the giant shopping cart. And you enter the store, you walk past the row of giant TVs. And like the siren song of Ulysses as he passed by the rock of Cilia, all four of your younger children's attention is immediately captured by the familiarity of their childhood friend, Blue's Clues, <laughs> blaring out from the entire wall of televisions at Sam's. But this is a radically different Blue's Clues from just five years ago when your children faithfully watched. This episode is being narrated by Nina West, the young protege of the famous or infamous drag queen RuPaul. Nina, or Andrew Levitt, if you go by his God-given name, is with the other cartoon characters at a gay pride parade and leading the rest of the cartoon characters in the following chorus. Families marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. Families marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. This family has two mommies. They love each other so proudly, and they all go marching in the big parade. And it goes on, and it uh, covers every different basis, including uh, families with three dads. Uh, 
struck me. Uh, you get back home, and after using the hand truck to unload your cereal into the pantry, you take a short break and pull up YouTube to finish the five, five final minutes of your podcast that or whatever it is you were watching. And in your queue, you notice a video, a paid ad, mind you, entitled A Message from the Gay Community Performed by the San Francisco Gay Men's Choir. Curious, you click on it, and a young man comes into view stating, as we celebrate pride and the progress that we've made over the past few years, we realize there's still work to be done. So for those of you out there who are still working against equal rights, we have a message for you. He begins to sing. You think we're sinful? You fight against our rights? You say we all lead lives you can't respect, but you're just frightened. You think that we'll corrupt your kids if our agenda goes unchecked. Funny, just this once, you're correct. We'll convert your children. It happens bit by bit, quietly and subtly, and you'll barely notice it. The lead tenor with his foppish eyebrows and sinister smirk signals that, oh yes, he really is coming for your children. And as the chorus of this large men's choir joins in, you're now the one that is spellbound. You didn't realize how much gay men today joked about pedophilia. Back in ancient history, like five years ago, this would have hit a little too close to home. And as I ponder the last 10 years and the tumultuous metamorphosis and I ask myself, is this real life? It feels like I'm inhabiting the pages of a dystopian novel. Now you may disagree with my analysis here, and that's okay. You, you are free to do that. But as a parent of five young children, uh, I'll be honest. This is the reality I truly believe. I watched a lot of cartoons growing up. I watched a lot of cartoons growing up. I don't remember cartoon characters ever marching in any kind of parades. This is the world we live in today, and it is. Whether you think so or not, whether you believe so or not, it does have an agenda that is aimed at the hearts of our children. Parents, we need to be aware of this, and mothers in particular need to realize that you need to guard your children's hearts to protect them as best you can from the onslaught of the world, and I don't believe that this is a call to just circle the wagons, go live out in the wilderness of Montana somewhere, but rather to continue to be pouring scripture into it. You know, I was struck years ago uh, reading a book about the Psalms of all things. One author, Terry Johnson, encouraged mothers to be singing the songs while pregnant because actually we know, known for a while, that noise penetrates the womb. And he said, start there. Never miss an opportunity to speak truth into your child's life. Quote scripture to them day and night. Find ways to encourage them to read the Bible. Read it to them yourselves. Get into the practice of family worship. All of these things, how we are going to guard our children's hearts. Another great quote from Rosaria Butterfield. So the world is in chaos and the church is divided because we have failed to obey God's plan for how men and women should live. 
We have done this permanent by permanently extracting the New Testament from the Old. We've taken the gospel out of the garden. And in the process, we have created a new measure by which to judge men. We truly believe, we truly believe that we could surgically remove the gospel from the creation ordinance. We foolishly believe that we could reinvent our calling as men and women, defy God's pattern and purpose for the sexes, and somehow reap God's blessing. You see, this is a call back to the gospel again. That as you instruct, as you teach your children, as you model for them, in marriage, in uh, your child rearing. That the gospel has to be preeminent, it has to be front and center. We must never take our eyes off that fact that, that, that do you realize that your child's greatest need is not from without, but rather from within? That they have sinful hearts, they were born with them. If they don't repent of their sins, they will die in their sins as well, just like the rest of us. If they don't profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and seek to lead their lives and live their lives for His glory. This in part is how Mothers are called to guard their children's heart. The third and final mark of a biblical woman that she would serve Christ in this church. I don't have time to go over everything here at every point. Some helpful principles here is that we learn to assume the very best of one another. Again, this goes back to assuming the best, best intentions of your husband. That maybe people don't set out to be deliberately annoying in the church, but sometimes that's the case. If you assume the best about them, you won't react with frustration and being annoyed as well. That we all, and women in particular, should serve the church with no desire for worldly compensation. It's going to be hard at times, as we've said already, it's going to be frustrating. But in doing so, it's not just women, it's all of us. We have the opportunity to show the love of Christ back to each other and back to the world. Thirdly, that in service, in serving, we actually become more like Christ in all that we do. John 22, 27, for who is greater, one who reclines at the table, or one who serves. This is not the one who reclines at the table. But I am among you as the one who serves Jesus. But in our serving Christ and serving the church, we become more and more like him whose service has set us free from our sin. Now, surely we are not salvific, providing salvation as Jesus did, but modeling him, seeking to act more like him, speak more like him, think more like him, it is never a bad thing. And then finally, I'm really along the same point. I heard the example of service. She improves all of those around her, even if the results are not human results, even if the results are not the success that the world 
says you will see. Interesting story I read years ago about B.B. Warfield. Again, maybe some of you have heard or know something about Warfield's personal life. Married a young gal named Annie Pierce Kincaid. Apparently she was a noble stock, whatever that means. And the newlyweds joint journey to Leipzig, Europe for their honeymoon. Their first day there, during their stay, an event occurred that would forever change the lives of the Warfield family. While walking together in the Hartz Mountains, Mr. and Mrs. Warfield were caught in a violent thunderstorm. This must have been some thunderstorm. Annie Warfield, some have even speculated, was struck by lightning herself, but she suffered a severe trauma to her nervous system from which she never fully recovered. She was so severely traumatized that she would spend the rest of her life as an invalid of sorts, becoming increasingly more in Capacitated for the years that went by. Her husband, B.B. Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, was to spend the rest of their lives together giving her his constant attention and care until her death in 1919. B.B. Warfield could not have foreseen just how constant and difficult a demand this was to become and how, in the providence of God, this would impact his entire career. J. Gresham Machen comments about Warfield. Warfield's remarkable literary output is no doubt in large measure due to the frail condition of his wife and his amazing devotion to her. With the pen, he was a formidable foe. But as O.T. Alice recalls, I used to see them walking together the gentleness of his manner was striking proof of the loving care with which he surrounded her. They had no children. They may never have been intimate in their marriage together. But during the years spent at Princeton, he rarely, if ever, was absent from for any length of time. Machen recalled that Mrs. Warfield was a brilliant woman and that Dr. Warfield would read to her several hours each day. And Machen dimly recalled seeing Mrs. Warfield in her yard a number of years earlier during his own student days, but notes that she had been long since bedridden. But even in this incapacitated state, almost as an invalid, barely able to speak, and you know, see the joy that this woman brought to her husband's wife, the care that she was able to give back to him, the devotion that she also lived with, the love that she enabled her husband to show back to her. It may sound strange, but yet is this not yet another example of how we are called to serve Yet another example of this great love that Christ has showed to us, completely incapacitated in our sin. That he comes and he stands ever present, enters into our lives, thinks the very best of us by his great love and devotion, redeems us of our sin. This is the only cure for sin. This is the only way that sin is taken away from us is through Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, men and women, young men, look to Jesus today. Know the great love that he has for us, the tireless and faithful devotion that he shows to you and to me. That he would lay down his life so that we might live. He would lay down his life so that we might serve him and his church. The 
protections that he has given to us to guard our hearts and to guard our children's hearts to hold this institution of marriage that he has created in the highest esteem let's pray together Father we praise you and thank you this morning for the high calling that you have laid upon our lives that you have created us in such a way in your image that we reflect back in some small way even. the love that you have showed to us and Father, we would pray that we would know as sure as our right hand is our right hand, this great love that you have showed to us in sending your Son, Jesus, to live where we've fallen, where we've fallen short, to die where we deserve to die, to be raised again to eternal life, that we have now and one day we'll experience even greater fullness. Help us as we go from here to love you more, to love our wives and husbands, <coughs> church and children more and more. We pray you do this for us in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll find our closing hymn, number 600, let's...